Uh, there's my wife, Amy. We will be celebrating 27 years of marriage this summer. We have got seven children, four boys and three girls, ages 23 to 7. Now, if you're uh, uh, counting folks up here, you might see eight children. That's because my oldest son here just got married to his bride, Emily. So we've added a wonderful daughter-in-law. Uh, my next daughter's getting married this fall. So we're launching kids. We're getting them off the payroll. And we have a first grader on the other end. So lots of joy, lots of happiness, lots of problems in our home. Daily, daily problems. Uh, we're a group that is very much in need of God's grace and mercy. Uh, in the worship service, I'm going to share a little bit more about my testimony and spiritual background with you. Uh, but because our time is short in this hour, I want to jump right in with you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you grew up in a home or are growing up in a home that practiced family worship. And when I say family worship, there was a regular time of family prayer or a regular time of family Bible reading. Put your hand up for me if you grew up in a home like that. One, two. Yeah, okay. You're a, a pretty sad group, um, but a pretty normal group. Only about 10 or 15%, and your group's pretty representative here, uh, only about 15% of church-going folks grew up in homes that practiced family worship, family prayer, family Bible reading. And as a result of that, especially in the late 1900s, early 2000s, family worship really went into decline. George Barna in 2005 found that only 5% of Christian families had a regular time of family prayer or family Bible reading in the home. So here's my challenge for you in this hour. I'm going to do a little bit of a biblical foundation for family worship. I'm going to do a bit of a historical foundation, some principles, and then get very, very practical with you about what are some ways with our kids, with our grandkids, nieces, nephews, we can get more spiritual life in the home. So here we go. Let's talk about a biblical foundation for family worship. Pastor, did you hand out some outlines? Okay, so you should have some outlines to track along with me here. First one is this, that the family is God's primary vehicle for the evangelism and discipleship of children. Sorry for the churchy words there. The family is God's primary vehicle for introducing people to Jesus and helping them grow in their faith. I'm going to share more about this scripture in the sermon uh, in our next hour, uh, but let me uh, show you this passage here. Whoop, i got to make sure my clicker is doing the right thing. There we go. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 to 6. This is a big one. Jesus says this is the most important commandment in the Bible. We call it the great commandment. Look at this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commands I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. This is like the purpose of life, why God made you. He wants to have a love relationship with you, and he wants to have his word in your heart. If you've been around church, raise your hand if you've ever seen this verse before. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Okay, yeah, very good. I'm hoping that you're raising your hand for that one. But now here's what I missed for so many years. The very next verse now, God speaks to parents and he speaks to grandparents. Look what he says. Impress them on your children. Other translations say, teach them diligently to your children. In other words, hey, if you want to love me and you got kids and grandkids, mission number one is help the kids and grandkids love me. If you want my word in your heart, mission number one, help the kids and grandkids have my word in their heart. So right away at the great commandment, we find the family and we call, find the call to parents to shepherd their kids. All right, principle two is that family worship is the engine that powers the Christian family. So your family is the vehicle that God created to help the next generation follow God. Family worship, these few moments of family prayer, these few moments of family Bible reading, that's the engine, the spiritual engine that powers the family. Um, how many of you have ever had conversations with kids or grandkids um, that how things were different when you were growing up? You ever have conversations, tell them how things were different? All right, one of the big differences with uh, what our kids have versus what we had is that our kids have lousy cartoons on television compared to what we had. Amen? You remember, uh, you remember this one? Okay, remember the Flintstones. All right, your kids have no clue what this is. But you, you remember the, the... I know, I got these young teenagers. Do you even know what I put up on the screen? You do? 
You're so smart. All right, well, listen, I'll just in case you don't know, it's the Flintstones, and this was their vehicles, their cars. Do you remember how they powered their vehicles, anybody? With their feet, yeah. So underneath here, it's open, and, and they just have their feet on the ground. And I, it did dawn on me as I grew up, like, so they're really, they're running everywhere they go, right? So why carry a car if you're going to run? I, but I don't think you're supposed to think about it that much. But you see, a lot of Christian families today are Flintstone families. Here's what I mean by that. They bring two things to the table to deal with all the problems in the home. They've got sibling problems, marriage problems, kid problems, finance problems, neighbor problems, church problems. They've got all these problems. They bring two things to the table to deal with those problems. Number one, they bring good intentions. They mean well. And they bring willpower. They're trying. So, all right, how many of you ever had a big family fight and you get people together at the kitchen table because you got to talk it all out and people say, sorry, it's okay, sorry, it's okay. And then you're going to end this with your grand speech. Okay, everybody, we all just need to try harder so that this doesn't happen again. Okay, you've done this before, right? All right, now, let's back it up, okay? Why are we at the table? We're at the table because someone sinned. Is that fair? Somebody did something wrong. Now, in my family, when one person sins, like eight people quickly sin thereafter. So it's not just one person, but nevertheless. So we're going to have a family meeting. Why are we going to have a family meeting? Because we need less sin in the house tomorrow. Isn't that the whole point of the meeting? So in order to have less sin in the house tomorrow, we all just need to try so that this doesn't... Good luck. We just need to be better people. How's that working for you? Take a look at this scripture. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Mission number one, impress them on your children. Okay, where do we start? What do we do? Talk about them. That's the them is the word of God, the things of God. Talk about them when you sit at home. Look at this. I never saw it before. Love God with all your heart. Okay, God, I want to love you. Where do I start? Talk about me at home with your family. Open my book at home with your family. Down through the centuries, this has been called family worship. These few moments of the day, this spiritual engine that powers your family. How many of you want your kids and grandkids to have faith? Put your hand up for me. Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need the supernatural power of God in our homes. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about how Christians down through the centuries have talked about family worship, perhaps in ways that are a little bit different uh, from us. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, he preached that husband and wife should practice united prayer and scripture reading uh, every morning. Uh, John Knox, 1557 says, you must make your children partakers in reading Scripture and in making common prayers, which I would in every house was done once a day at least. Uh, This next one I'm going to share with you during the church service, so I'm going to skip these slides right now. I'm going to go to a couple more ahead. Take a look at this one. Thomas uh, Manton. This is 1650. I love this. A family is the seminary of the church and the state. And if children not be well principled there, all miscarrieth. And what is a seminary? A seminary is a theological training ground, isn't it? It's a place you get theologically trained for ministry. And they used to teach that the family was the seminary of the church. And it was the training ground for culture. The training ground for the state. Here's one more. Richard Baxter, 1799, the life of religion and the welfare and glory both of the church and the state depend much on family government and duty. If we suffer the neglect of this, we shall undo all. And I would suggest to you that this is exactly what we're seeing in our culture today. Let me give you some quick principles of family worship, and then we'll talk about the practice. Quick principles. Number one, the family is the in, family worship. When I say family worship, I'm talking about those few bumbling, stumbling moments of family prayer and family Bible. Family worship is the intersection point 
of a right relationship with God and a right relationship with family. Your two most important relationships in the world connect in these few moments. We're just coming to God saying, God, we want to be right with you vertically, and we want to be right with each other horizontally. Those two most important relationships intersect in these moments. Number two, family worship is more than family devotions. And you can pick whatever kind of term that, that you want. People say family time or really old school. I guess it would be family altar or something like that. But, but we use family worship. But a big mistake that families make is they think of family worship as Bible class. The number one question I get, Rob, how do you do family worship for seven kids ages 23 to 7. All right, well, my oldest one's married, not a kid anymore. We'll do six kids still at home, ages 21 to 7. How do you do family worship for that wide range of ages? Now, built into the question is this idea of Bible class, that I have curriculum that must be taught, content that must be delivered, and how am I going to teach content to 21 and 7 at the same time? Well, I don't view it that way. It's not Bible class. I don't have curriculum and content. There may be truth and doctrine we're going to talk about, but, but we can all pray. Mom, dad, 21 to 7 can pray. We can all hear God's word. We can talk about it. Sometimes our conversations go older kid. Sometimes our conversations go younger kid. Sometimes our conversations go nowhere. Sometimes, sometimes I'm leading family worship, and I get the sense that my little congregation is eager to conclude. It's just like my, my little spider sense is tingling, right? And uh, so I'll say, hey, are you guys, uh, you guys feel like we need to make this kind of short? Yeah, Dad, let's wrap it up. We got stuff to do. Okay, great. Who wants to pray? As, oh, you unspiritual children. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, sometimes I don't want to be there. Right? Sometimes it's just not going well. So we'll read something from the Bible. Hey, what truth do we learn from this passage? Or how did God speak to you through this? just crickets. You know, it's okay. How about we try again tomorrow, right? No big deal. We're going to wrap this all in a lot of grace and a lot of love. All right, this next one could do a whole hour talking about this. I got to do it in one minute. Family worship prepares children for worship in the family of God. Family worship in the little home with the little family prepares children for worship with their big spiritual family. And in fact, children who do not have family worship in the home, family prayer, family Bible, dare I say family singing, when they come into this place, a lot of times they feel like a fish out of water. They're not used to praying with other people. They're not used to singing with other people. They're not used to sitting and hearing God's Word read and interacting it with their spirit. Now, I'm not saying that children who grow up in family worship homes doesn't mean that a 10-year-old is doing cartwheels coming into church but I am saying that their little heart is getting prepared. Their little spirit is getting trained for worship with their big family. All right, I am going to now transition to talk practically with you about how can we very practically, very specifically, take some baby steps forward with family worship in our homes. And my first practical challenge to you, uh, I'm going to get a little bit intense here. In fact, I'm thinking about my day, right? Okay, I got these different. This is probably the most intense I'm going to get. And it's a bad uh, scheduling because it's 9, right, 20, and we're all still kind of waking up. But just sit up straight, take a deep breath. He's like, oh, he's going to get intense now. Uh, here we go. This is about as intense as I'm going to get with you all weekend. Are you ready? When it comes to family worship in your home, start somewhere. Is that intense enough for you? Like, that didn't seem very intense to me. Okay, here's what I mean by that. What I want you to do is I want you to think about what's going on with prayer in your family right now and what's one small step you could add. What's going on with Bible reading in your home right now and what's one small step you can add. This um, kind of principle dawned on me. I had a couple uh, come to me for counseling. Uh, they were uh, an older older than me, couple in the church. At this time, I was probably, I don't know, 40, and maybe they were in their 50s. But this was a, a godly couple, a mature couple, and they came to me and they said, Rob, we want to get more spiritual life in our home. Okay, again, I kind of looked up to them, so this was, felt a little upside down, but okay, let's talk about it. So I said, hey, let's talk about prayer. Uh, what kind of prayer do you have going on in your home right now? I assume you pray before meals. What other prayer do you have? 
And when I said, I assume you pray before meals, this woman, um, she kind of shifted awkwardly in her seat in my office, and I picked up on the, the nonverbal cue, right, the counseling eye. And I said, did I say something that made you feel uncomfortable? She said, well, you said you assume we pray before meals, and it's probably been 10 years since we've done that. Now, it's a serious Christian family. Somehow the enemy had kind of wormed his way in there and robbed them of this basic Christian practice of praying before they ate. So what was Pastor Rob's grand challenge to them about the next step of family worship in their home? Pray before meals. Yeah, hey, how about we start praying before we eat? How about we get that territory back again? We'll take maybe three months and build that in. So now I want you to imagine... This husband and wife are walking out of my office at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And for the first time in 10 years, in about three hours at dinner time, this guy is going to say, how about we pray before we eat? How's he feeling? Feeling nervous, embarrassed, insecure, inadequate. And why is that? Because he's already experiencing spiritual attack and spiritual resistance as he prepares to kick into gear with spiritually leading his family. You see that? A lot of families are not experiencing spiritual resistance because you're parked on the side of the road. How much resistance does a parked car get? Nothing. If you kick into gear and get out on the highway, now all of a sudden you're getting resistance. So I'm just giving you a heads up. As we go through this day, and I'm going to be talking to you about these scriptures, about accelerating faith in your homes, you need to be prepared for resistance. You need to be prepared even in your own heart. Anxiety, insecurity, inadequacy, spiritual attack. Hey, how, how dare you pray? You haven't prayed for 10 years. What do you think? You're just going to start praying again now? Yeah, I think that's what I was going to do. I was just going to start praying again now. And God's going to help me take this step. Okay, I'm going to give you now. Uh, six elements of family worship. Six elements of family worship. You're all taking notes, right? You got this handout? Here we go. I want you to write these down. Six elements of family worship. Activity, singing, Bible reading, discussion, prayer, and catechism. Activity, singing, Bible reading, discussion, prayer, and catechism. Got these? Activity, singing, Bible reading, discussion, prayer, catechism. Write those down. Now this is critical, you hear me. My message this morning is not, 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 not. When you sit down for family worship, thou shalt do one, two, three, four, five, six. It is not what I'm saying. I'm giving you six tools in your toolbox. Sometimes you reach in for number one and number four. Sometimes you reach in for number two. Sometimes you reach in for number six. Got it? This is mix and match. Six tools in your toolbox so you're going to be better equipped with your kids, grandkids, nieces, and nephews. All right, let's talk about this first one, activity, activity. Some of the best family worship times in our house come when we put a little bit of time, a little bit of prep into an activity, a game, an object lesson, that particularly helps the younger kids, they all like it, but particularly those sixth graders on down. Now, here's my problem with activities and object lessons in games. A, I'm not creative, number one. B, I hate crafts. I hate them. And they actually paralyze me. So, like, if you say, hey, you could teach your kids a great gospel lesson with popsicle sticks and glue, it's not happening, friends. I don't know. I don't have popsicle sticks. I don't know where the glue is. And it's a glue is in the drawer. Yeah, that's too far. That's not happening. So <clears throat> when it comes to these activities, like I need the lowest possible bar. We, we do a lot of um, Bible charades in our family. You know what charades are? Like you, you act something out, people guess what it is. So we say, hey, pick a history from the Bible. We call them histories, not stories. Hey, pick a history from the Bible and act it out, and we'll, we'll try to guess what it is. Now, my 11-year-old boy, Ray, particularly when he was younger, was a gifted dyer. Oh, 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 like he would die, okay, act out. So Millie, his older sister, would say, oh, I got one I want to do, but I need Ray. Well, you know somebody's going to die. That's why she picked Ray. So she's acting something out from the Bible with Ray, and, and, she, and he's like, do it, man, do it, and he does his death. And the problem 
like from a, from a charade standpoint, you're, you're trying to guess the Bible story, right? Bible history. So many people die in the Bible that it doesn't narrow it down as much as, as you might think. Uh, here was another one. Uh, this, we, we got the Scrabble tiles out. You know, you, your Scrabble game. Okay, and if you don't have Scrabble tiles, you can make them. I know it's a craft. You get paper, you write A and B on pieces of paper. And we put them in a little bag. And I had my boy Rush. I gave him the bag of Scrabble tiles. And I said, I want you to dump the Scrabble tiles out. You know, just take the whole bag, dump it over. And I want you to spell your name, Lucas Rush Reno, just and exactly right, just by dumping the Scrabble tiles on the ground. So he said, well, I'll do that. Okay. And he takes the Scrabble tiles and he shakes them out. Right? And the, the letters go everywhere. And he says, oh, oh, there's an L. I got an L. I'm like, no, no. I want Lucas, Rush, Reno, all spelled straight. He goes, okay, I'll throw it again. And he puts them all back in the, the bag again. Well, of course, he, he's not going to get it. And so we do that a couple of times. And then we go right to the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This didn't just happen by chance. These aren't just random molecules all shaken together. It's absolutely impossible. You can't, he could do that Scrabble thing you know, as many times as he wanted. It's not going to happen. So we're just talking about uh, God's intentional creation uh, of the world. Uh, you know, I've done, I've got to keep my eye on the clock. All right, I'm going to keep moving. I'm going to keep moving. Let's talk about singing. How many of you sing in church? You sing in church. Put your hand up for me. Good, good. Um, Miss in the teal back there. Yeah, tell me your name. Hi, Amanda. You sing in church? Are you like worship team girl or are you like regular folk? Good. Okay, me too. Me too. Yeah, I, am. I will preach, but I will not sing. I, I can make a joyful noise to the Lord. People don't like it. God does. So I sing, but whatever. Okay, so you sing in church. Um, let's imagine our church service is going to start in about a half an hour. Let's imagine this morning there's an empty seat next to you, uh, near you, and a visitor comes in person you've met before, they sit down near you, would you still sing? Okay, but you still would sing out loud? All right. I didn't set that up properly. <laughs> I, again, really early for me. I came down from, I drove this morning. Um, you ever heard the phrase, stranger danger? Yes. Okay. So this is an unknown human sitting next to you in church. Would you still sing out loud, even quieter? You would? Wow, you are a very spiritual person. No, I'm very impressed. Some, everybody's like, leave her alone. How, is Amanda, is that what you said? How many of you are just like Amanda that you would sing next to a total stranger here in about half an hour? Wow, incredibly mature group, <laughs> Pastor TJ. That's amazing. Amanda, I, I believe you. I'm sure that you would do that. But as soon as I say, hey, how about singing at home with your family? You're like, oh, I don't know. That's pretty awkward. See, you're going to sing in public with a total stranger in half an hour. But as soon as I say, hey, how about singing at home? You're like, no, that's creepy. I'm not doing that. Um, listen, remember, these are tools in the toolbox. Maybe you've got 18 and 16 at home. I don't say go home tonight and say, hey, we're going to start singing together. Maybe that's not the first tool you take out of the toolbox. But if you've got two, four, and six at home, or the grandkids come visit, and you say, we're going to start singing together, what do two, four, and six say? Woohoo! And you're going to grow into a family that sings together. I, my favorite part, Christmas and Easter, right? After services, we go over Amy's mom's house, and there's the food, and there's all that great stuff. And then Grandma sits down at the piano. She starts playing hymns, playing Christmas carols. Everybody gathers around. We're singing praise to Jesus. Friends, I, didn't, I, 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 look, I look at what's happening in this group. I did not grow up like this. I had one alcoholic grandmother that didn't know Jesus. And my kids have four grandparents that love the Lord and their grandma's sitting at the piano playing worship songs on Christmas. Not the way I grew up. And it's the way my kids are growing up. Unbelievable. Okay, where are we at? Activity, singing, uh, Bible reading. Um, number one question uh, that, that people ask, or one of the top questions that people ask when it comes to family worship is, Rob, do you have a, a curriculum? Do you have a guide? Do you have a book? Do you have a curriculum, a guide, a book? Because we didn't grow up this way. We feel a little nervous. We feel like we need some, some help. And I've got a really small yes and then a, 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 a big no. I'll really give you the curriculum in a second. But we, we, our ministry writes family worship guides. 
Okay, we write family worship guides through books of the Bible. There's one of them back out at our resource table, Family Worship Genesis. It's a walk through the book of Genesis. And every week we give you, get ready, an activity, songs, scriptures, discussion questions, prayers, catechism that you can mix and match uh, and use. I'd also lo- I'd love to get you a free copy of this. And all of you that are watching online, I'd love to get you a free copy of this book. You just go to visionaryfam.com. That's our website, slash grace visionaryfam.com slash grace. Write that down. You go there, we'll send you a free ebook of this family worship guide. If you want the paper thing, you can get it at the resource table, but visionaryfam.com slash grace, you get a free copy of the book. Okay, now put that out of your mind for a second because I want to give you the curriculum. Here's the curriculum for family worship. Are you ready? Take your Bible, open it, read it as if it were the very words of God and that you believed it with all your heart. That's the curriculum. You want your kids to have faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Well, what if my kids ask me a question that I don't know the answer to? It's all right, call TJ, but it's two in the morning. He wants to get your call. He wants to hear from you right away. No, it... It's okay. There's things in the scriptures we don't understand. There's things in the scriptures that are too marvelous, too wonderful for us. That's all right. We're going to talk about those things. When we read the Bible, we're going to ask two questions. Number one, what truth do we learn from this passage? And number two, how does that truth apply to our lives? What truth do we learn from this passage? How does that truth apply to our lives? You see, um, unfortunately, a lot of our Bible uh, teaching and learning experiences, we really have stopped and skipped the first piece. Too often we go to, how does this apply to me, or what does this mean to you? So I'll give you a quick example. Jesus and the calming of the storm. I should have had the slides for this. I wasn't planning on sharing it. This is bonus. It's free. Um, Jesus and the calming of the storm. So Jesus falls asleep on the boat and the disciples are terrified. They wake him up, master, master, we're gonna drown. He stands up, he rebukes the wind and the waves and then the disciples say, who is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? And so children, what this means is that just like Jesus calmed the storm, of your, uh, calmed the storm back then, it means that he can calm the storm of your life too. Raise your hand if you heard something like that before. Okay. What you just did is you shared a history from the Bible and you gave an application. You didn't give any truth. You applied something that Jesus did to your current life. You're like, I don't, what are you talking about? I think that's, I thought I did give you the truth. No, that's not the truth we learned from the passage. You're like, okay, well, you're going to have to tell me then what the truth is we learned from the passage. The truth we learned from the passage is in the disciples' question. Who is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. Children, what this teaches us, the truth we learn from this passage is Jesus was no ordinary man. In fact, he was God himself, the creator of the universe, in command of the world. Now, children, if Jesus is God himself, how might that truth apply to our lives? Well, I guess... If Jesus is God and in control of everything, then then he can help me with my storms and problems too. Ding, 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 ding. So I don't have any problem getting to this application of Jesus' power in our personal lives. Fine. But if you skip who Jesus is, which is the point of the text, you skipped it. You skipped the whole thing. Does this make sense? So what truth do we learn from the passage? That's where you're going to have to work because that's the piece we don't do anymore. And then how does that truth apply uh, to our lives? Okay, discussion. i got to move. Discussion. Uh, we're gonna t- again, we're going to talk about the Scripture. We're going to talk about how it applies to our lives. Sometimes the, con- the discussion goes older kid. Sometimes the conversation goes younger kid. Sometimes the conversation goes nowhere. Relax. It's okay. Prayer. One of the best ways to get prayer going is with something called high-low. High-low prayer. We do this at the dinner table. Uh, we'll say, okay, hey, what was the high part of your day? What was the best part of your day? And we'll have some kids share. By the way, we don't make our kids share, and we don't make them pray. You're invited to share. You're invited to pray. If you don't want to, that's okay. But what was the high part of your day? Oh, I had this. I had this. I had this. Awesome. Hey, would someone just pray and just give God thanks for those things we just heard? Someone says a short prayer. Hey, what was your low today? What was your hardest part? Well, I had this. I had this. I had this. Lord, thank you for, for sharing that. Anybody willing to pray and just ask for God's help with these hard things we just heard? Yeah, I'll pray. 
High-low is awesome on a few different levels. One, um, there's a lot of highs and lows that go by in each individual's life in our home that never get shared because life's busy, life's crazy. So high-low gives you a chance to stop and hear each other's hearts, highs and lows, and it gives you a built-in opportunity for thanksgiving, for the blessings, and it gives you a built-in opportunity for asking uh, for, God's, uh, for God's help. Uh, catechism. Raise your hand if catechism is a familiar word to you. Raise your hand if it sounds creepy. Okay, all right, I got 50-50, so I'm going to talk about it. It's an old-fashioned word, and if you're not familiar with it, it does sound a little weird. Catechism is just a, a way of teaching people the basics of the Christian faith. Better to call it like questions and answers, questions and answers. And, and when you have a catechism, there are questions to be asked and answers to be memorized. And it teaches people the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. The, uh, you might go, well, that's really exciting. It, it actually is really fun. Kids, kids love it. I wish, I've thought about, you know, maybe I should videotape like one of our family worship times. And then when I come to your church, I could like, put little clips up on the screen and stuff like that. But I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, we've got our white robes on. The light from heaven is shining down <laughs> upon us. Too holy a moment to set up the video camera. No, there... There is a lot of like, okay, don't bite her, and uh, where is that kid? And yeah, it's all very normal. But I, I, I'd like to show you, I, I wish I should have a video of the catechism, because it's really cool. So let's say that Millie, my 13-year-old, is the catechizer. What that means is she gets the book, she asks the questions. Okay, Rush, question number one, who made you? God made me. Correct. Okay, little brother Ray, what else did God make? God made me and all things. Again, correct. Okay, big sister Lainey, why did God make you and all things? For his own glory. Again, correct. Okay, big brother JD, why should you glorify God? Well, because he made me and takes care of me. All right, big sister Lissy, how can you glorify God? Well, by loving him and doing what he commands. And you have these questions that just lay out the basic doctrine. See, some of you are here, listen, I know. You're like, Rob, I, you, I didn't grow up in this kind of house. Okay, and I'm like a new Christian. And now you want me to teach seminary in my house. If that's you, if you're, you're like, I don't know Genesis from maps. That's my best joke. And two, <laughs> you get it? There's Genesis in the front and maps in the back. I, there you go. You people are terrible. Okay, but you, you feel very inadequate. You feel very insecure to do this. The message here is not, thou shalt be a perfect Christian to help your kids be perfect Christians. That's not the message. This is, look, I want to bumble and stumble forward in following Jesus. I want to invite my kids to come with me. And if you're feeling like you are not well grounded in your own faith, you need to be catechized. You need to be systematically taught the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. So the, the catechism we use, it's from Truth and Grace, book one. Truth and Grace, book one. It's $6 on Amazon, $20 at my table. No, I wish. I'm not that good a businessman. But uh, it's also, these catechism questions are also in the free family worship guide you're all going to get, right? Visionaryfam.com slash grace. But the, uh, in order to lead your family, listen, you just need to be one question ahead. So children, this week we're going to talk about who made you. Children, who made you? God made you, right? So now in my mind, as leader of the family, i got to be thinking about question number two, which is what else did God make? God made me and all things. So catechism helps me, helps me lead. Uh, I'm going to um, share a final story with you and pray, and then we're going to transition before our, our service. I want to challenge you to uh, put together a family worship room in your house, a family worship room in your house. We have a family worship room in our house. Let me describe it to you. In the middle of the family worship room is the prayer table. We bought it at Ikea. You all have Ikea down here? No? Sort of, kind of? Okay, well, it's like a build-your-own-furniture kind of place. And I, I buy these things, and I build it, and then I have all this lumber and screws left over. And I'm saying, I don't think that's right. But whatever. I don't want to get sidetracked. So I bought this. Our, our previous prayer table we bought from Walmart. And Walmart has a whole section of prayer tables. You've got to ask the guy, because it's like a religious section in the back. He'll take you there. But it is, they are, it's rectangular and knee-high. What do normal humans call this table? 
Coffee table, that's right, but no, do we call it the coffee table? No, we call it the prayer table, because when we pray, we're going to pray at that table. Then there's also two, uh, I don't know, long, puffy things that people sit on. What are those called? Couches, yes, or sofas, yeah, absolutely. Then we've got a couple uh, square tables with lamps on them. What do we call little tables? Oh, interior design over here. End tables. Picture the room. Can you picture it? What do normal humans call the room? Living room, family room. I was in Georgia. A woman said, oh, that's the parlor. What are you talking about? It was a parlor. Okay, but whatever. It's the living room. But we don't call it the living room. We call it the family worship room. Why? Because it's the most important thing that happens in that room. You see, you name the rooms of your house. You have a dining room. You dine there. You have a bedroom. You go to bed there. You have a playroom because you play there. You have a kitchen because you kitchen there. You see, you, have a, you name the different stuff. The most important thing that happens in that room is family worship. Let me tell you a story. Six or seven years ago, we moved, and during this move time, uh, we're out looking at houses, right? Real estate agents bringing us to this house to rent or this house to buy or whatever. And on two occasions, I had the exact same experience. God gave it to me twice because the Lord wanted me to remember what happened. We, we go to this house, and uh, the real estate agent is at the front door letting us in. And my daughter, Lainey, who would have been 10 or 11 at the time, she's 17 now, she's the eager beaver. She wants to get in and see the house. And then I'm following her up the stairs, right? Real estate agent, Lainey, dad. Got it? Real estate agent opens the door. Lainey jumps in the entryway and goes like this. Dad, this could be the family worship room. Now we're getting somewhere. And my question to you is, why is a 10-year-old jumping in the entryway of the house trying to find the family worship room? She knows we are a needy group, spiritually needy, relationally needy. This is a spiritual meal that our family needs. This is the engine that powers our family. Jesus says, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I share that with you to just say this. I'm going to close this in prayer in just a second. The driver, listen, the driver for more family worship in your home is not discipline. Discipline has its place. The driver is not, we need to do this, this is important. The driver is neediness. We need time with God in this house. We sin every day in this house. We need the grace of God, the mercy of God, the strength of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and we need the renewing power of his word. And friends, if we're not hungry for God's word in our house, we got a much bigger problem. You know, if you've ever been with someone who's very, very sick, one of the signs that they're in real trouble is they've completely lost their appetite, right? They don't want to eat, they don't want to drink, or anything like that. And so one of the signs for us spiritually, when we have no spiritual appetite, we don't want God's Word in our house, we don't feel the need to be in the Bible, we don't feel the need to go to church, that is like five alarm fire when it comes to our spiritual life. We are way sicker than we even think that we are. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to take a break and get ready for worship, right? Okay, let's do that. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this church. I thank you for a church that has a vision to, to strengthen us at home because we all fall short there every day. So I pray as we've just talked about uh, the power of family worship, our need for family worship, that you'd help us just take a small step even today, this week, this month, a little more prayer in our homes, a little more open Bibles in our homes and maybe some of these other elements that we talked about today because we want our homes to shine for Christ and we want our families to pass faith in Christ through the future generations. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Folks, I'm thrilled to have the day with you. During the break, I'll be hanging out out there. I can talk with you, pray with you, help you with resources, but church is starting soon. And I'm going to find out. They said that... Um, the Sunday school hour is kind of probationary if I get to preach or not. So I'll talk to pastor. If I get the green light, I'll be preaching. If he's up here, then you know that it didn't go well. Okay, see you soon.